Hey, Chris here from IELTS Advantage. So about three weeks ago, we released a video showing a real student, Rashmi from India, doing a mock IELTS speaking test with me. And in three weeks, it has nearly 400,000 views. So obviously you guys love this type of interaction and the comments were that you love to see how I was able to help a student in real time and help them improve their speaking. So what we decided to do was bring Rashmi back into our office and do a brand new series of videos with her. And what we did was we split it into part one, part two, part three. So we're going to have three videos and each part at the beginning, I'm going to give Rashmi advice and feedback on how to do her best in each part. So you guys can watch that and learn from it yourselves, then see Rashmi's performance, and then I'm going to give her feedback on her performance. Talk about her pronunciation, her grammar, her vocabulary, and her fluency and coherence. And without further ado, here it is. Okay, Rashmi, so what we're gonna do first is I'm gonna give you some advice on how to perform to your best in part one. All right? Okay. Uh, so we're gonna talk about part one itself first, some strategies, some techniques, and then we're going to talk about the four marking criteria. So uh, pronunciation, fluency and coherence, gramma grammatical range and accuracy, we'll just call that grammar, and lexical resource, we'll just call that vocabulary, okay? Okay. okay. All right, so part one, the best way to describe part one is just normal everyday small talk type questions they're all questions about you so you can't get them wrong <laughs> don't try and think of like impressive ideas or anything like that but just think of it as having a normal conversation with somebody um let's say you and i were colleagues or classmates or something like that and i was getting to know you so i'm asking things about your hometown where you live your interests, your hobbies, just normal getting to know you questions. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So like we, we talked about before, one of the things that students do in this part is give very, very short answers. So for example, where are you from? Mumbai. Mm -hmm. Or what's your job? Data analyst. And in a normal conversation, that would be fine. But because you're in an English test, the examiner needs enough data, enough information to judge your fluency, your pronunciation, your grammar, and your vocabulary. So try and develop your answers a little bit more. An easy way to do that for part one is just answer the question and then add a little bit more detail. Um, so you could give an explanation or an example or a little bit more detail. So let me give you an example. If somebody asked me, um, what's your job? I wouldn't say teacher, I would say, I'm a teacher and I specialize in teaching IELTS. Primarily, I do it online. I have a company, you know, a little bit more information that I, and it will also allow you to develop more complex sentences. As if you say things like, um, hello, my name is Chris. That's a very simple sentence. But if you add a little bit more detail or an explanation or an example, it makes the sentence a little bit more complex. And for someone like you who is aiming for the, the band eights, the band nines, that's what you would need to do. Um, so any questions about part one? No. All good. Okay. I think the, the, the main criticism um, last time for part one was just shorter answers. So try and... and, and the other thing is not too long either. Um, I know that's frustrating advice, like not too short, not too long. Um, the thing is, if you, you... The examiner has to ask you a range of different questions and they only have four or five minutes to do that so if you talk and talk and talk and talk the examiner will keep stopping you and then often students can feel like oh what did i do i'm doing something wrong and they'll get stressed out and that can affect their fluency um so uh, i don't like to give students like number of sentences or number of words um so just follow the rule answer the questions a little bit more detail you know two or three sentences maximum um if you're going over like four or five sentences probably that's a bit <laughs> too much but don't but don't be thinking counting words or counting number of sentences or anything like that okay so um for fluency last time your fluency was great uh there was a few ums and ahs and likes and and fillers like that but f good fluency is not about never 
mm, or uh, you know none of those little uh, audible pauses. If you listen to the greatest speakers of all time, they all pause and have little audible pauses, and 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 that is not what good fluency is about. Good fluency is just speaking at a normal pace without an unnatural number of pauses or hesitations. And and you do pause and hesitate, but naturally, like everybody else. When I'm speaking, when you know, when anybody in the world is speaking, you pause because you need to you need to think. Um, so your fluency, no big no big problems there. Coherence. You do answer the questions, but sometimes are a little bit too short, especially for part one. We've already talked about that. For pronunciation, your like intonation, your sentence stress, your connected speech is all really, really good. Um, your clarity is also good. One thing, though, you're you're a shy girl. <laughs> I know you're a little bit timid. Sometimes when people, not that there's anything wrong with being shy. You know, I, I was shy when I was your age too. Um, people who are, are shy tend to speak at a low level. The volume it can be a little bit low. They don't enunciate their words as clearly. So f you could improve your pronunciation by pretend you're speaking to me, you know, and I'm standing a little bit further across the room, and and speak from your your diaphragm, not from inside. So a lot of people speak from inside their mouth, um, whereas people who enunciate very well speak from their their diaphragm their stomach so if you try and don't shout at me or anything, <laughs> okay. but, um, but pronunciation is really good for you so you don't I'm just just a little tweak it's not nothing no big deal grammar your grammar is incredibly accurate and um, very very accurate a nice wide range and I think that by extending and developing your answers a little bit you will add complexity to your sentences as well so we don't need to worry about that your um, vocabulary is also very very good um, however I think to push on to the next level during your preparation like this is preparation this is not the real test you could try and take a few more chances not trying to use like fancy vocabulary but the best way to improve your vocabulary I think is to think of more topic specific words so if we were talking about data analysis, there are certain words that we would use, um, such as, you tell me some, some words that you know more about data <laughs> analysis than I do, um, analytics, um, AI, artificial intelligence. You, you would only use those words really when you're talking about that topic. So when we're talking about these topics, try and think of some topic specific words, but be careful, you, it can also affect your fluency if you're trying to think of big words. So you're like, I want to think of this word, and then it affects your fluency. So yeah. only if it comes naturally. You don't want to be sitting there thinking, hmm, what big word will I use? Um, but I think try and um, improve it a little bit. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah, good. Do you want to start? Yes. Okay. Okay. So first, Rashmi, do you work or do you study? Oh, I study. Uh, I'm studying at Queen's University, and uh, I'm studying a master's in marketing and uh, majoring in um, marketing analytics. Excellent. Why did you choose that degree? Oh, uh, I chose uh, to study analytics because uh, I'm interested in big data and big data is uh, becoming really popular these days. Uh, a lot of companies are, uh, have now started to uh, look at their dark data. Uh, I'm dark data which means like data which was collected but uh, they have not done anything about it. It's just lying around in the database. So uh, now companies are starting to use that data to analyze it and look at trends, uh, past and future trends, which is uh, falls in in the predictive analytics category. So, I'm very much interested in uh, looking at both uh, the behavior of data and the consumer behavior, which the data tells you. So, the analytics uh, lets me uh, study that and look at uh, the data in terms of how you can manage your customers better. So I want to learn analytics because of that. Is there anything that you would like to study in the future? Uh, I would like to study uh, Python programming language. I'm currently studying that, and I would like to master it because it lets you create and develop your own programs because these days the data analytics uh, software is very expensive. So it's, it gives you much more power to control your own uh, dashboards, and you can create it on your own. So I want to learn uh, Python programming because of that. 
And now let's talk about your hometown. What kind of place is your hometown? Oh, I come from a very small city in India. It's uh, in western, northwestern region. It's called Baroda. And it's a princely state. Uh, we still have a king who lives in a palace there. So there are lots of palaces uh, throughout the city. And uh, it's called the cultural capital of uh, my state because uh, there are a lot of like reading and exhibition arts and culture is uh, very much promoted there. And what's the most interesting part of your hometown? Uh, I would say the palaces. There are a lot of palaces throughout the city and they're like really beautiful. Uh, in the past, only the king was allowed to be there, but now it's open to the public. So we can go around and see all those palaces and there are lots of museums in it with uh, 1800 years of history. So it's really great. Uh, and also we have uh, a river which uh, flows through the city and it's very famous for having a lot of crocodiles in it and it was featured on National Geographic so because it's the largest river in a city with most number of crocodiles in it. So that's a custom attraction I would say. <laughs> and uh, what jobs do people do in your hometown? Um, well like I said my city is uh, very small so most of the people have small businesses, they are business owners and th the students there, they don't, they don't really have too many opportunities. So they go out either out of the city or they go out uh, abroad to study or to, to, f to look for an occupation. But in my city, there are not too many opportunities sadly. But there, uh, we have uh, like some big companies like pharmaceuticals and uh, we have uh, chemical industries. So those type of jobs we, we do have, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. And now let's talk about colors. What's your favorite color? Mm. I don't really have a favorite color. It's like depends on my mood. But I am told that I'm most of the time I, I tend to wear white or black. That's what I'm told. But I don't really think of a color when I go to buy clothes. I just like pick anything. I don't think I have a favorite color. Mm -hmm. No. And are there any colors that you dislike? I dislike red. <laughs> it's because uh, uh, I had a, a traumatic experience once, so that color scares me. Um, but other than that, there are no colors that I dislike. And are there any colors in your country that have a special meaning? Yes. Uh, but India is a secular country, but most of us are Hindus. So uh, orange is a color of my religion. So you, you'd see orange flags on temples. So orange is very prominent. But the Muslims, they are in minority, but they're, they are, there are a lot of Muslims in my country. So they have the green flags. So whenever there is a festival, a Hindu festival, you'll see people wearing orange and uh, waving orange flags. And when there is a Muslim festival, we would see like people in processions uh, carrying uh, green flags and wearing green. Well done. OK, so that was m how did you feel? Was that different from the one that you did last week? Oh, I can't judge for myself. I can't judge. <laughs> I'm a teacher. I should just tell you. <laughs> people in the comments would say. <laughs> uh, no. Well, uh, well, well, let's talk about the differences. The main difference was you developed your answers much, much more. And um, so that would have helped your coherence, would have helped your fluency, um, would have helped your, your grammatical range as well. So you did a, you did a really, really good job there. Um, there was only one where you, you talked a, a, a quite, a, quite a long time, <laughs> um, but you only did it for one, one, one answer. Um, the examiner would probably only stop you if you did that for every single answer mm -hmm. because they need to ask you a range of different questions. Um, so you did uh, really, really well in terms of coherence. You answered every question. Um, everything that you said was related to the question. So you did a very, very good job. Uh, Grammar, again, extremely accurate, um, wide ranging. It used a range of different tenses and structures. Um, and your, your uh, sentences were more complex that time because you were adding in more clauses because you were adding in more detail and explanations and examples and just elaborating a lot more on, on the answers. Um, in terms of vocabulary, you did, a, you did an excellent job. I think that you used even more topic-specific vocabulary and you tried to push yourself a lot more. Um, and, and again, the most important thing is accuracy and your vocabulary is extremely accurate. So you did a, a very, very good job there.
Uh, with pronunciation, again, the intonation was great. The um, sentence stress, connected speech, all really good. I could understand 100% of what you were saying. Uh, you did try and enunciate a lot more. The people watching might say, I didn't hear this or hear that because it's the microphone and it, because of the sound and they're list- w- watching on their little iPhone or whatever. Um, but in the, in the studio here, I can understand everything that you're saying, which is great. Um, one of the things that um, was brought up in the comments before was that you have a tendency to say like, which is, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can use the word like. The primary way that you use the word like is to is for examples. Um, so when you're writing an essay, you would write, for example, for instance, that's a more formal academic way, um, or such as. Uh, but when you're speaking, if you listen to how people from this part of the world um, say, uh, give examples, instead of saying, for example, they'll say like, um, which is totally normal. It's not a, you're not using it as a filler, you're using it to exemplify things to use it as examples. So that was totally fine. Um, and one of the questions you, I asked you about a color that you dislike and you said red and you were talking about an emotional thing, something traumatic that happened to you. So anyone watching, uh, I've had this happen to me um, in the cl- during the test where someone, y- you ask a question that is quite innocent and the person thinks of some horrible <laughs> event that happened in the past, and then they start to think about that event, and they start to get very nervous and stressed out and emotional, and that can affect their performance. So anybody watching, I would avoid talking about traumatic things. Like I've, I've sp- I think about it, yeah, it's it's totally natural. It just pops into your mind. Um, like the very first lesson I ever taught. I asked this lady about um, uh, her family, and she was a, I didn't know, but she was a refugee, and her whole family had died. And I was like, oh my God, you know, you, you just, and, and she kind of fell apart, and because and obviously it was a traumatic thing for her to talk about. So if this happens, in, if you're watching <laughs> this video, avoid emotional traumatic things um, in, because it can put you off, you know. But you did an excellent job. Very, any questions about part one? Uh, I don't know what intonation means. Intonation? Okay, so intonation is the tone of your voice. So we convey meaning when we're speaking English. We convey meaning through words, through facial expressions, but also the tone. So a good example would be if I came home late and I said, hi, honey, to my wife, how are you? And she said, fine, fine like with a rising intonation, that means she's fine. But if my wife said fine with a downward intonation, that means it's not fine. <laughs> or, if I, or if a student came into the classroom and they were late and I said, please sit down, please sit down. So going up and then down, uh, that would mean that I'm totally fine and it's a polite way to, to ask him to sit down. But if I said, uh, please sit down, Please sit down. Sounds very serious. So because it's just there's just a falling intonation. Um, but you have very natural intonation. It's it's very difficult to learn um, for a non-native English speaker. So you're doing a good job with that. Thank you.